Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jack Wallace and welcome to the 55 Live podcast. I'm here with a very, very special guest this evening. And also I'm here with, as usual, California. How are you, Carl? I'm good, Jack. I'm, I'm so excited for tonight's chat. Um, I just can't wait. Let's get into it. Yeah, and as usual, uh, we are in conjunction here with the uh, WCWA network. As usual, you can check out uh, all of the uh, podcasts on the network as well as uh, all of the links for the audio podcasts on uh, Anchor FM or otherwise just go on to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Um, but otherwise, yeah, other than that, we do have a very special guest tonight. We do have former WWE superstar as well as a motivational speaker and um, the forefront of his own uh, anti-bullying campaign. Uh, we have marvelous Mark Mirror with us tonight. Mark, how are you doing tonight? Uh, it's today hey where you guys. are, actually. Thanks for having me. Good to meet you guys. Yeah, awesome, man. Uh, it's great to meet you too. Um, you know, it's actually, I saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, sorry, a few weeks ago when I contacted you, one of your videos on Facebook, and I hadn't heard of you or seen what you'd been doing for years. And uh, so I was actually really pleasantly surprised to see that you were doing uh, motivational speaking and doing some absolutely awesome stuff around the world. Now, some of the videos as well were very touching as, uh, you know, as we briefly spoke, uh, bullying in schools in particular is a very, uh, it's a very touchy topic uh, being through it. Uh, pretty extreme myself. So uh, it was awesome to see that, man. And uh, it just felt right to sort of get in touch with you to be able to sort of have this conversation tonight and uh, be able to really just, um, you know, just kick back and talk with you ourselves and uh, really see what goes on in the mind of uh, Mark Merrow in uh, 2020. So, uh, Carl, I'm going to throw it over to you, man, and uh, we'll get started. Cool. Thanks, Jack. Um, Mark, uh, first out of the gate, I just wanted to ask you, were you always a wrestling fan growing up? You know, it's funny that you asked that because uh, my dad actually took my, my brother Joel and I to wrestling matches when we were kids. And uh, man, I, I mean, this is back in, uh, you know, Bruno San Martino it was champion. There was uh, uh, Chief White Owl and Bobo Brazil and the Sheik. And, you know, growing up, the cool thing was, is growing up watching these guys, then later on in life, getting into wrestling business myself, meeting them in person when we went to the city that they lived in, they would come backstage and say hello to the boys in, in the locker room. And it was like, you know, re re reliving a childhood memory I had of seeing them wrestle. And it was just so cool to, to actually meet them in person because it was like they were bigger than life when you were a kid. And to this day, I still have many of their autographs. I had a little autograph book. We'd wait for them to come come out after and they'd sign you know, their name on a little uh, this autograph book I still have to this day. It's so cool. <laughs> That's really cool, man. Um, so it was your dad that took you to the wrestling and all that stuff. Um, I, I read... Uh, uh, just tonight that um, growing up when you were eight years old, your parents got divorced. Um, my parents got divorced when I was uh, five years old. Um, so I just was interested to know how, uh, how that affected you at that age. Well, it's so detrimental because you don't, you know, as a kid, you don't really understand. I never really saw my parents fight or heard them fighting. I didn't, you know, it was just a really strange thing that um, I remember coming home from school and seeing my dad's car parked in the driveway after school was unusual because my dad would work until around dinner time, you know, and come home, we'd all have dinner together. And his car was there early. So I was excited to see my dad's car there early that day. I remember running in and into the house and my mom was in, in the living room and she had her head buried in her hands and she was crying. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? And I, I just remember my mom lifting her head saying, daddy's leaving. And I mean, I didn't, even, you know, eight years old, think about how young you were when your parents got divorced. You don't really yeah. understand. And I ran into my mother and father's bedroom and there was my father packing his suitcase. And I just remember just, you know, just begging my dad not to leave. And, uh, you know, he, unfortunately my, my dad left, but he didn't leave my life. I mean, my dad would pick us up every Sunday and we would do things with my father. And of course he got remarried and, and had a family and my mom eventually got remarried and I had a new little uh, brother. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it all worked out fairly well. The, the only hard part was is that we, we, we moved into one of the worst drug and gang infested neighborhoods. We were so poor. And that was really when I understood the, the part about, you know, how people treat each other and how I was treated as a little boy, uh, being that my mom would buy a lot of our clothes, like at garage sales and things like that. And you know, you had second, third hand clothes on and kids would mock you out or pick on you and bully you. And I, I, I'll never forget that feeling. And I, I always thought, you know, now I have that opportunity. I understand what kids go through. And I think that's a blessing through my struggles. I really found my strength. And I share that with students, man, that we're not defined by someone else's opinion. 
and it's really helped a lot of kids, man. And I, I got so many kids that, that, that follow me on social media that write to me and you know, they go through their ups and downs in life. When, you know, one moment they're living the best life, they're happy and then something happens and they're, they're writing to you about, you know, of, of something sad that's going on in their life and you, you try to help the best you can, you know? Yeah, that's great, man. I, I, uh, I mean, I went through it too and, it was very difficult for me to understand what the hell was going on because it was just so confusing for me. But um, it's great that you could take that uh, lesson that you learned at such a young age and, and uh, teach kids today on how to get through it. Um, I think uh, as I was like helping prepare these questions tonight, I could see all these things that you did as a young person playing hockey. Um, you obviously became a, a Golden Gloves boxer. Um, but I, I, I can, I'm imagining that you've probably been asked about that so many times. Um, but were you always athletically gifted and, and did you always, you know, find yourself heading towards, uh, doing sports in your adult life? Well, you know, I never thought I would be a professional wrestler. I mean, I always thought, you know, it's, it's amazing because hockey was my first love. I loved hockey. and I wanted to be a, a professional hockey player. And uh, the, the problem was that I was spending more time in the penalty box getting into fights. <laughs> so in the off season, I would go to the boxing gym and, you know, hit the bags and just become a better puncher, you know. And, um, and, and then I decided that uh, I met the, my, my eventual mentor and trainer, Ray Rinaldi, and he said, well, you know, why don't you, why don't you, let me, let me get you a fight. And I thought, sure, you know, and next thing I know, I entered the, the Golden Gloves and I won that and won another <laughs> tournament and actually made my way to the USA boxing team. So it was an amazing journey. Then I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to go professional in boxing. And I turned professional in boxing in two weeks before my first professional boxing match. I had my nose shattered in an accident oh. and I needed reconstructive surgery. So uh. in that time off, now my whole life was, you know, hockey, football, boxing. I never had like off seasons because I was always training for something, you know? And when I broke my, when I got, when I got my nose shattered, it was the first time I could remember, like I had this free time. I couldn't do anything. So I had to take all this time off. And it was in that time that I started thinking, I never got to go to the parties, I never got to hang out with my friends, never got to go out drinking, never got to have fun. I just started hanging out with the wrong people, man. And But I always thought, you know, in that time off, I could have come back in a year and I'm going to be champ of the world, man. And hanging out with these people, getting involved in drugs and, and, and alcohol. And I remember kept thinking I'd be drunk at parties, thinking I'm coming back in one year and I'm going to be champ of the world. Right. One year became two years, two years became four years, and four years become... 10 years of my life of drug addiction. And, right. and I think it not now, here I am 30 years old. I mean, you know, what, where am I going at 30 years old? And I remember getting a job. I was building swimming pools, digging swimming pools pretty much, you know? And uh, it was at that time that um, we were at my apartment and I had a bunch of friends over. We were, and, and my buddy was flipping through the TV channels. And he landed on professional wrestling. Now, me thinking I've always been an athlete, you know, and, and I was always in pretty good shape. I go, and I just remember saying, man, I can do that. And my buddies busted out laughing. They go, man, look at the size of those guys. They would pick you up over their head and throw you right out of that ring. I said, no, I'm serious. I can do that. My buddy says, Mark, you're 30 years old. What are you going to do, start a pro career now? And it just put in my mind, man, I'm going to give this a shot. So I found out where there was a wrestling school and it was the Malinkos. Um, you know, Boris Malinko had sons, Joe and Dean Malinko yeah, were pretty yeah. you know, famous wrestlers themselves. And um, I remember uh, uh, going to his school. It was about, a, it was about a, an hour away from where I lived. So I drive there after work and on weekends. And it was only a year later that I, I, I signed a contract with WCW wrestling because of Dusty Rhodes. He, he saw me and thought I had potential and he started that character, Johnny B. Bad. And my whole life changed, man. It was, an, it was an incredible journey. And then making it, you know, to the pinnacle of wrestling, getting into one of the big organizations, you know, and then eventually going to the WWE and achieving this amazing financial stability in my life. But then going back to the same bad choices, you know, yeah. party life, hanging out with bad, you know, the wrong people, um, you know, get, get, got addicted to cocaine again. It was like just took the worst period of my life and then going through a divorce and my life just spinning out of control and then losing my little brother and sister they both died at 21 
My mom died at 58, which the video's viral. And my dad died while I was holding him in my arms. So losing everything and all of a sudden you're in this horrible depression. Now, who would ever think that going from the pinnacle of, of having everything, being a, a multimillionaire to losing it all and then starting over again in this depressing place in my life, think, never thinking that this is the place I'm going to be able to help millions of people. Never, never, you don't, get, you don't get the press goes, man, I can't wait to get out of this and help somebody. You think, I don't even want to be here anymore, you know? Yeah. And then now looking back on my life and thinking, wow, I wouldn't have changed a thing in my life knowing that I've had such an impact on so many people. Every day I get, I get about at least 100 messages a day. And most of them are about how a video or my presentation or something I said on social media or something changed or even saved their life. So knowing that, what I had to go through has helped somebody else. I would never change a thing. Absolutely. Um, I, I was actually really interested to hear what it was like training with the Malenkos. Oh, uh, you know what? I got to tell you, uh, the, it was mostly the dad, Boris Malenko. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with yeah. their dad. He was a very popular wrestler. He was a great, great heel back in the day, you know? And um, I mean, it, it was, you know, here I am very kind of overconfident thinking, you know, wrestling, I'm going to go, I was a boxer, football player, hockey player, you know, I was a tough kid. And I remember it was getting in the ring for the first time. Um, I had to do something like just cross your arms, just fall backwards in the ring. It's kind of like, okay, you know, and of course, not knowing how to fall properly. <laughs> I sound like a sea, a seal from SeaWorld. I'm like, eh. <laughs> oh my gosh i thought wrestling was fake <laughs> it was a really i and then and then hitting the ropes over and over you end up with black and blue marks on the side of your, your your ribs here and uh so i learned very quickly to respect it and uh and, and boris Malenko was a great teacher he was a one and he's a wonderful person too um, very sad when he passed, uh, but he, and now, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm very good friends with, with, with his son, uh, um, uh, Joe and, um, and, and Dean, I don't see that much, but Joe has come out to my presentations when I've, when I've traveled to Tampa and that's how we became uh, really close. Oh, that's really cool, man. I'm glad that you're still in touch with them. Um, yeah. over to you, Jack. Yeah, uh, so you mentioned about your uh, initial tryout uh, and also being noticed by uh, Dusty Rhodes. So tell us the story of uh, that tryout uh, with WCW when Dusty Rhodes well, um, it, had noticed you. It wasn't really a tryout. See, what it was, I was living in Venice, Florida at that time. And yep. and you and I met these guys at the gym that were, um, um, they, would, they would drive to Atlanta to be enhancement guys, you know, jobbers, they would call them, I guess, you know. And um, they would get paid. We get paid one hundred and fifty dollars to drive nine hours there and nine hours back Jeez. to get beat up on, tel on national television by one of the superstars in WCW. So I decided to go with them. And, and and there's a bunch of guys that come from all different parts of the country that hope to get picked. Yeah. And I was in good shape, had a pretty good body. And I remember uh, they chose me and another guy to wrestle Doom, uh, Butch Butch Reed and Ron Simmons. They were the yep. tag team champions at the time. And of course, it was just a squash match. They just kicked our butts, you know. And I remember I, I, I messed up some spots or something. You know, I was so green. I didn't even know what that guy was doing. And after the match, they said, uh, Dusty, Dusty needs to see you in his office. Because Dusty Rhodes was the booker back then. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, God. And as soon as I walked in, I go, listen, Dusty, I'm really sorry about the match. He goes, no, 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 no. It's nothing to do with the match. He goes, kid. Anybody ever tell you you look like Little Richard? <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> who is Little Richard? Now I'm thinking he's talking about a wrestler named Little Richard. So I said, I don't know who's Little Richard. He goes, Little Richard, you know, a bump, bump, a whoop, bump, a loop, bump, boop, you know. And I'm thinking, you know, oh, the singer. I go, no, no one's ever told me that. He goes, I think I got a gimmick for you. And I, I mean, here I am, I'm just starting out. I'm thinking, oh my God. <laughs> I may sign a contract with WCW, you know? So next thing you know, um, you know, they, they, I did a few more job matches or squash matches. Uh, next week was like, I wrestled Sid Vicious, which is all over the internet where he puts me in a, in a, in a, a stretcher and it clotheslines me out of the stretcher. <laughs> you know, it's like horrible. <laughs> uh, but he was a great guy, you know? And uh, so anyways, to make a long story short, they took me off TV, but I was thinking, I mean, I, I'm really broke in my life. I'm, you know, I'm making like 20 grand a year digging swimming pools, you know, I'm broke. Yeah. And, and, um, 
uh, I, I, so I wrote Dusty a letter saying, you know, hey, can I come back at least do jobs while I'm waiting to do this Johnny B. Bad character? He goes, oh, no, I don't want you yeah, back on television. I want to keep you off TV for a little while. And next thing you know, they called me for television. And they had um, 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 Marlena. Remember Marlena? Yeah. Um, and she, she was the hairstylist for WCW at that time. She wasn't an on-air talent. Or she okay. was. She was uh, uh, Alexander York. That's it, yeah. A long time ago. So yeah. she would like, so next thing I know, they put me in this makeup chair and they, she does all this makeup on me, my hair all poofed up. And <laughs> and next thing when she spun me around, I'm like, oh my God, I do look like little Richard. Dusty <laughs> <laughs> like, Rhodes, it was his blueprint. I mean, he saw something that no one else has ever seen. And it, the best part about being Johnny B. Bad was that I got to go to the matches early because Dusty always wanted to work with me on my on how I talked, how I walked, how the character, how he saw the character. Now, Dusty was a very flamboyant character himself. So the best part about being Johnny B. Bad is watching Dusty Rhodes be Johnny B. Bad. He walked <laughs> to the ring, he goes, I'm so pretty, I should have been born a little girl. He goes, now you do it. And I'd be laughing so hard at him, you know? So we had the best time, and he'd say, oh, hush, Johnny. I'd say, oh, hush, Dusty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and they'd hug him, you know. Oh, that, those were some of the best times, you know. And then teaching me, the, and then it was so funny because when I would get it down the way he saw it, he'd be going, oh, that's just amazing, man. He'd be, it's what he always saw me do. And so eventually, I really, you know, here I am some, somewhat speaking at schools, too, and one of the questions kids would always ask is, why did you wear all that lipstick and makeup? So I asked Dusty, do you mind if I take the makeup down? He goes, oh, no, no, it's part of the character, man. So as you guys know anything about wrestling was they have, before you go out to the audience, there's the curtains. It was called the gorilla position. Yeah. It's where you, you wait before you go out. And Dusty would be sitting there with a monitor and he'd be watching the matches as the booker. And... I would come up there getting ready to go out for my match and I didn't have makeup on. Oh. And he'd go, go back and put color on right now, you know, so I'd have to hurry and and rouge and eyeliner and everything, you know, and then I'd come back and go out. Well, little by little, I would just soften it up more and more. And eventually he just kind of gave in to me and said, you know what, let's make the character more of the, you know, it was like a combination of Muhammad Ali and Little Richard. We took it more to the Muhammad Ali side of it, you know, and that's where the, the kick your booty with my two different fruit. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. It was a combination of Ali <laughs> and Little Richard, you know, so it was, it was just a lot of fun and just the best memories. I mean, you know, going to the pinnacle of wrestling, the WWE, I mean, it's like you to, to really say you made it is going to the dance. The dance is WrestleMania. You know, so yeah. it was like always that dream of getting to the dance and finally making it there. But I would never, the Johnny B. Bad character was by far the, the most fun I ever had in the business of wrestling. Being, you know, Wild Man, Mark Merrill, Marvelous Mark Merrill, there was no, no comparison to the fun and entertainment it brought as being Johnny B. Bad. Cool. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of fun uh, back in the early WCW days, especially because, I mean, you go back and you look at the roster, it was stacked. Do you have any uh, sort of uh, fun memories or any particular stories of some of the people from back then? Uh, say, um, I don't know, Carl, who, you, you know early WCW more than I do, man. I'm, I'm oh, well, you years know, old. <laughs> you guys you know, around there, you know, you got Sting, you got, you got, uh, the craziest Dusty thing is, Arn Anderson. I, I'll tell you a, a kind of a, a cute story was, uh, you know, Ric Flair was with us too. And uh, now one of the guys that I watched on television, obviously was Ric Flair. And you know how he used to, he used to put his hands out and you go to grab it and then he'd go, woo, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now here I am wrestling Ric Flair. I'm like in the finals of this European Cup or something. I, I, it was a tournament in, in uh, Germany, Dresden, Germany. And I'll never forget it because it was my first time wrestling Ric Flair. And I was so nervous because it was like, oh my gosh, I'm wrestling Ric Flair, you know? Yeah. My idol growing up in, in the wrestling business, you know? And so backstage you, you always go to the your the person you're wrestling with and go so what would you like to do and, and rick was just he's like don't worry about it man i mean like just tell me what like would you what spots where he goes brother i just call in the ring and i'm like i'm so nervous because you know it's like i always knew exactly what i was going to do you talk right. over the guy he'd say i'll throw you off drop down leapfrog whatever it is you'd memorize it you know 
And now here I'm going in not knowing anything other than the finish of the match. And I was so nervous. And it was the most fun, easiest match because everything, okay, well, before I get to that part, so we start the match out and he does this to me. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna grab his hands. And as soon as I went to grab him, he goes, woo! And it was like deja vu. It's like, now I see myself in my living room watching him on television. And it's <laughs> the ring, you know? It oh. was so cool, you know? But anyways, you know, he did all his typical moves. You know, you, you throw him into the turnbuckle, he flips over, he goes along the, the apron, you clothesline him out, out on the apron, you know? And he did, and he made me look like a million bucks. And so I know the finish is the figure four leg lock, right? So he gets me the figure four leg lock. And of course, I'm going to tap out. But what he does, he says, oh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Reverse it on me. So, you know, you spin over. Next thing I got yeah. him. It yeah. was so, it was like I got Ric Flair in the figure. I didn't know how to put the stupid thing on. He put it on me. So I knew I just had to stay in it and, and, and turn him over, you know? And now he's like fighting, you know, the, the figure four. And eventually he turns me back over and, and I have to tap out, you know, and that was it, you know. But, man, I got to tell you, when you, you know, when you got to the arena, you didn't always know who you were going to wrestle that evening for television, you know. And they have a big blackboard with all the matches that were on there, one through whatever it was, eight or ten or whatever, how many matches there were going to be. And whenever you saw your name and Ric Flair, you're like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, a night off. <laughs> you know, yes. Easy night. As opposed to some guys when you saw your name go, oh my God, this is gonna hurt. You know? <laughs> so, Man, it must have been real. You know what's funny that you, you mentioned that about memories is that someone just posted on Twitter and I, I actually retweeted it. It was a match between me and Ricky the Dragon. It was me tag team with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat against um uh, stunning Steve Austin and uh, Lord Stephen Regal. You know, this is back, you know, in WCW yeah. days. I mean, I'm, I'm match, I think they're like they're thousands of matches. You don't remember them all, but I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't even remember. I was actually tagged with Ricky the Dragon Steve. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. The all time greats in wrestling, you know? And I think about the, the guys that I wrestled or tag team with, you know, um, that I never got to wrestle. Like I, I tag team with um, Bret Hart, with, with Shawn Michaels, but I never got to wrestle against them, you know? Hmm. And it was just a joy to be in the ring with such, you know, I don't know, I guess I look back at the time I was in the wrestling industry, it's probably the greatest time there ever was. I mean, when you look around our dressing room and I got to the WWE, I mean, there's Ultimate Warrior, there's, there's you know, um, Bret Hart, there's Shawn Michaels, there's Triple H, there's Undertaker, there's, I mean, and then WCW, they're Sting. And I, I got to be with some of the greatest wrestlers in the history of wrestling. You know, so I look at the time I was there, the Attitude Era was probably the, the best time. I mean, I wrestled Stone Cold Steve Austin and King of the Ring, you know, and had an amazing yeah. match with that guy. You know, I, I love it. I mean, think, I think about the guys I wrestled the most. There's three guys, okay, that I probably wrestled maybe 200 times each, you know. First of all, Triple H. And Stone Cold Steve Austin, because we were, we were both in WCW and WWE together. So we had lots of runs together. And then one of the guys I wrestled over and over in WCW, probably every single night for the longest time for a couple of years, was Diamond Dallas Page, who's one of my awesome. best, best friends in the world, you know. And, uh, you know and, that, and he was so much fun to wrestle because he was the most intense guy you ever wrestled. Like, you <laughs> It's easier to be in a regular fight than sometimes wrestling DDD, you know? <laughs> we, would, we would beat the heck out of each other, you know? But we, yeah. we were so we were so close that there was never like animosity or like, man, you really hit me too hard or something like that, you know? But funny story about DDP was he was so intense. Like DDT, at that time, he was very uh, new to wrestling and he always wanted to have the best match, which, yeah. God. Got to give that guy credit. He was just the hardest worker I've ever seen. I'd go to the I'd go to the power plant with him and work out matches or work with him and stuff. And he was so intense. We were doing a pay per view together. And next thing I know, my I'm sound asleep and it's like three o'clock in the morning and the phone rings. And I said, "Hello." And he says, "Hey, bad man, it's DDP." <laughs> I go, "Hey, what's up, man? You okay?" He goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got a spot I want to run by you." What? <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. He goes, you know when you throw me off and I drop down and you, when you leapfrog me and this and I'm like, else? 
it's three o'clock in the morning. You couldn't wait. He was, I just was, I had to tell you about this spot, man. I've been thinking about <laughs> But looking back on that, as pissed off as I was at the time, I look back as the, it's everything he, he stands for, how hard he works, how much he loves to help people. And, and we always had a great match. I mean, I think about our matches, man. We, we really, if you look back on some of our WCW pay-per-views, we're yeah. some really good matches, man, you know? For two guys that were fairly green. I mean, remember, I got in the business, and I, I only... I went to school in 1990. I had my first contract with WCW in 1991. Now, next thing I know, I, I, I didn't know, as, as Ric Flair would say, or as Aaron Anderson would say, he didn't know a, a, a wrist lock from a wrist watch. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Aaron was one of the funniest guys, too. Um, it, it's like, so here you are, so green, don't even hardly know what's going on in wrestling, and you're wrestling Sting. You're wrestling Ric Flair. You're wrestling, yeah. you know, you're you're in there with the Road Warriors or 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 Ron Simmons or you know the top guys in the world, and they're all treated me so so professionally, you know, and 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 guys that really took the time to help you out that aren't always talked about, you know, um, uh, Raven back then he was Scotty Flamingo, you know, would help me every night, um, Steve Regal, uh, Ricky Morton. I mean, guys that would take the time and show me moves and the psychology of wrestling. And because I was so new, it was like kind of laughable to see me wrestle. But I eventually got to one of the most improved guys out there, you know, for hard work and going to the power plant, my off days and trying to become a better wrestler, not just a flashy character, Johnny B. Bad, but learn how to do some moves. And next thing I know, I'm doing these crazy moves off the top rope and, and, and you know, doing athletic moves that were really cool absolutely i remember saying some of the stuff like you know you're a bigger guy than the cruiserweights that you would see later on and you're doing head scissors takedowns and you're doing shooting star presses off the top rope and it's really quite impressive for someone that was bigger than the usual lightweight wrestler um and one thing i wanted to say about ddp and yourself is i see a lot of parallels where you got into wrestling at the age of 30 and i think he started training at like 35 or something like that <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. We, we always had this running joke that he always had to taught me everything you know i was rookie of the year <laughs> at, at at 31 and you know he goes and wins rookie of the year at 35 <laughs> so he's like always got to one up me you know and you know to this day oh gosh this is so funny guys we are in competition the the, the ddpy i do the ddpy you know and, and so one of the things he does in ddpy is the 10 second push-up well it's really a 30 second push-up because what it is is let's say you start from the top and it's 10 seconds down you hold it for 10 and then push out for 10 seconds so all together one rep is 30 seconds okay? right okay. and so me and ddp have this competition where we go against each other now now we go head to head you know with this push-up where we're looking each other in the eyes this is how competitive <laughs> it is okay? so the first time we did it it was i mean this is back in i'm guessing 2007 2009 when they had ddp it was called ddp for yoga for regular guys YRG. yeah 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 yrj yep yeah. So he first does it with me and we both get, I can't remember the number. Let's say it wasn't a lot. Let's say it was like six, just to throw out a number. I don't remember what the number was. And we both like get six, okay? And we're looking right at each other and he goes, brother, I'll call it a draw if you're ready to call it a draw. Like he gave me my out because <laughs> we were both fried at this point, right? I said, no way. So we go back down. <laughs> and now over for 10 and then go to push out for 10 and I couldn't lock out my arms so he beat me now it's been my <laughs> ever, okay so now fast forward to 2019 I go to I have been prepared for this man I go to his DDP <laughs> studio there and I stay with him at, well I always stay with DDP when I'm in Atlanta you know so I'm staying overnight with him right and he goes tomorrow morning so we have this competition right and I finally beat him, man. Oh, oh yes. great. Yes. And he, but now, now I've created a monster. Now he's like, he, he, now see, he, he just doesn't settle, okay? So now he's like, <laughs> son of a bitch. And <laughs> he's uh, now he's really still training more for his DDP, the 10 second push up. And now a few months later, I go back and now we're up there though. We're up in the tens, you know what I mean? We're, we've yeah. got, we've got this, we, we can do push ups for, five or six minutes straight without stopping. That's a long time, right? Yes, yes. And uh, so now, 
he, he beat last time he beat me. I think he got uh, 10 or 11 and I got nine or 10. I can't remember, but we were nose and nose again, but he doesn't realize that I am above 12 now. So when I get back, he, you know, he went to a, a health scare. We talked to talk to everybody, the COVID, you know? Yeah, so I, I was in Atlanta uh, last month. I couldn't go see him because of COVID and we were going to have our competition. And so I have now gotten myself in such good shape. So uh, I'll wait till he comes back from getting healed from the COVID and, and uh, let him get his numbers back up. But we will always, <laughs> we will be old bastards in our 80s competing for something stupid, you know? Now, when we trained together in WCW, it was always like uh, the Stairmaster push. It was sit-ups. It was uh, hanging bar crunches. It was always something we would compete with. So it is a, and it's this amazing friendship that has fun competing. Like when he beats me, I'm like happy for him, but it's like in my mind, I want to get it back, you know? <laughs> um, I actually wanted to ask you a question about um, the, uh, the, you know, you looking like little Richard. Did you ever have an excited fan come up to you asking for a signature and say to you, I love your music? Absolutely. I, I, there were so many times <laughs> I think, thought that I was Little Richard. It was really strange, you know? You know, one thing that happened just recently, now you know Little Richard passed away a few months ago. Yeah. And um, and I always wondered what he, because they, they had pictures of him holding up my poster at like a concert. And he right. said, you know what they say, he's pretty, he's not as pretty as me, and he ripped off the poster, you know? <laughs> so I, always, I always wondered, did he, did he enjoy the character? Well, something happened recently. His driver contacted me and, and through social media. And really? said, hey, man, I, I drive, you know, Little Richard passed on, but I, I was his driver. And I, I want you to know something. He loved that character. He thought it was the That's funniest awesome. thing, you know. So to That's hear great. that just made me, because all these years I always wondered, was he, you know, I mean, they say that um, the best form of flattery is imitation, you know. Yeah. And, and um, so I always wondered if he enjoyed it. And I was so happy to hear that that he really really enjoyed the character so that was that was something great uh, that's great uh, after all these years you know you don't have hate with little richard that's good no, that's awesome. no. <laughs> <laughs> um i uh i was like doing some research about you today and um saw that you'd work with cactus jack a little bit i just wanted to know what it was like working with cactus jack back then because he was he was pretty uh intense <laughs> yeah um you know i mean the funny thing is like i got to wrestle cactus jack as every character <laughs> yeah <laughs> time, dude love you know uh uh let's see it was well, there was there, there, there again, Mick Foley, Cactus Jack, Mankind, Dude Love. So I wrestled all those characters. But, you know, um, it, it, not taking nothing away, he, he's one of the legends in our industry, you know. But I think our, I, I was just very green when I did wrestle. I and mean, I remember that I probably screwed up some of our matches, you know. And uh, our, our styles were so different. Like, he was more this brawling, you know. And so I, I wasn't able to do some more of my my high flying things. I, I can't remember exactly, but, but I remember that, you know, it wasn't as probably as good as he would have liked it. You know, I was just honored to be able to wrestle that guy and, and what he does for charities and kids and people today is just, man, he's another one, just like DDP loves helping people. And I got so much love for that guy. Yeah. He yeah, is a he's saint. He's a great human being. Um, yeah. Incredible. Uh, so uh, you're in the company in WC from 91 to 96. You're featured quite prominently. You win the television title several times. You're a star of the future in WCW. What were your hopes and dreams back then for where you wanted to go in wrestling? Well, obviously, everybody wants to be a world champion, you know, and I, I really hope that, you know, as I'm learning and getting better in my matches and stuff, I had some wonderful matches with some of the guys there with DDP with uh, flying Brian Pillman, you know, one of the yeah. classics I had with him. And um, so I was really hoping, but when, when, the, when the offer came from WWE and my contract was up with WCW and, um, and they matched each other's amount and everything. And, and WWE gave me a big signing bonus. I was one of the first wrestlers I ever get a guaranteed contract with WWE back then. Yeah. And it opened the door for many others to get guaranteed contracts. But I wouldn't go unless I got that guaranteed contract, a big signing bonus. And I wanted my, my wife at the time to fly everywhere I flew, 
In other words, I didn't want to, I watched too many guys go through divorce. I thought the only way that yeah. I'm going to save my marriage is she's going to travel with me and be a family on the road kind of, you know, but, yeah. and, and then I saw it. I remember the time saying to uh, Vince, I said, you know, when he agreed to that stipulation, which was unheard of, you know, no one brings yeah, their right. wife on the road, you know, and not even thinking that she's going to be part of the show. I said to him, I go, you know, what about having my, my wife, since you've got to pay for her flights anyways, why don't you have her be my valet? And he goes, no, no, he goes, let's just, let's just worry about you. And so when they sent me my, my plane ticket to fly to uh, Stanford to sign my contract um, and meet everybody and go over the, with the creative team, <clears throat> there was only one ticket. And I, so I called Vince, I said, hey Vince, there's only one ticket. You, you have to fly my wife too. He goes, to sign a contract? And I said, she goes everywhere I go. And that was just part of the deal. And he yeah. agreed to it. So he fl flies me and, and Rena Sable, who eventually became Sable, to, to uh, we fly to New York and st or Stanford. And, and um, when he sees her, he goes, I got to put her on TV. I mean, <sighs> just, oh, she's beautiful, you know? And that's how the whole thing. So then we got to choose the name Sable. And that's how it all started as her being my valet and eventually becoming a, a, a superstar herself in wrestling. Absolutely. I remember when I first saw her on television, I must have been maybe 12 and I'd never seen a woman that looked like that before. So it completely changed my perception of women because it was like girls at school, ew. But then all of a sudden I see Sable, this beautiful woman, and I was just like, it, it kind of made me a man almost. Like I, I all of a sudden saw this beauty in women and I now really wanted to be around girls a little bit more. Um, I was wanting to say that uh, I was actually a little bit late to us getting on the podcast because I was watching your tuxedo match with Steve Austin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just I, wanted you know, to I just, ask you I just, about that. I did this podcast a couple months ago and, you know, we, we, we had a great time talking, but you know, it's better after the podcast, we, we stay on the phone for about 45 minutes to an hour, just reminiscing about old times and, and WCW because we wrestle each other so much, you know, and, and then, so, oh, I don't know who came up with that idea with the tuxedo mats that we're, we strip <laughs> each other down naked. You know? Yeah. Sorry. I just thought it was hilarious. I wanted to bring it up. We had a, we had a laugh about that too. I mean, it's just crazy that you, you gotta be really careful because you don't want to, you know, it, there's a whole process to the match of taking yeah. off a sleeve and a, a shirt and then a jacket or whatever it is, you know, that would have to come off in order to eventually strip the guy down to his wrestling trunks, you know? Yeah, I just thought I just thought that you guys played it so well. You, you made the drama of the match go so well. You Usually you're used to pinfalls and submissions and all that stuff, but you, you're ripping off a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. I just thought the psychology of the match was really quite good for, for what it was. I mean, a tuxedo match. I mean, you, you hear that and you're like, I'm doing what tonight? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, nothing surprised me though. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to say something about Steve Austin though. Sure. One of the greatest ever with psychology, man. You know, oh, something that Steve did, and I, I think I've said this on another podcast before, but one thing that Steve did that, that was really amazing about him is that he watched every match. Like he would be at the curtain and watch everybody's match. So when you wrestled him, he already knew all your moves, he knew what you could do, what you couldn't yeah. do, what you were. What, you, what, what your strong points were. And that's what made his, his psychology was phenomenal. And, um, you know, I, and, and he's, he's a guy that, you know, we weren't even really close friends back then, you know, but now I consider him a, he's a friend, man. He's a great guy. And um, just so proud of where he's taken his career. You know, there's so many wrestlers that after their career ended, you know, ended up on hard times. And it's just so good to see guys that have continued to, capitalize on on their their prominence in the wrestling industry and then and even reinvent themselves and do new things in life and steve has done new things and some so many guys have done great things and then there's this, the sad part of guys that haven't been able to you know reinvent themselves or 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 you know through injuries or whatever it was health in issues or whatever couldn't yeah. capitalize on the fame they had in wrestling yeah that is a shame there's a lot of them um uh, back to you jack <laughs> Sure. Uh, you leave WCW after objecting to an angle uh, between yourself and Kimberly Page. Uh, what was the angle that made you want to quit? Well, you know, uh, Arena Sable and I, yep. we have a daughter named Mariah. And Mariah would see me on TV with another girl and it would really upset her. 
you of know, and, and it wasn't like this big objection. It was just going to the office and saying, hey, can I just not have a manager, you know? Yeah, and right. it wasn't, and it was blown so out of proportion, you know, that oh, if I don't get this, I'm leaving. It was nothing like that. It was just a suggestion that is it okay because they really thought Kimberly and I gelled. I really like Kimberly. She's a great yeah. person. And, and a friend to this day, you know? Uh, but it was just at that time, I, I really wanted to keep my family and not upset my daughter with me, her thinking I'm leaving her mother because I'm with this other girl on television. Right. You know? yeah, so it wasn't, it, it was really blown out of proportion. And um, uh, so, and in fact, it's so funny that Mariah, she's coming to stay with me next week. She lives in Maine, but we have a, we have a, I have a granddaughter, Sophia, you know, Mariah's 30, two years old now, you know, wow. <laughs> and so they're, they're coming next week and we're going to do the whole universal and Disney thing together. So oh. I can't, I can't wait. And, uh, but anyways, that was the, the whole process of that, but it led to, it, and you know, when I look at the whole thing, how it all played out, I, I know Eric Bischoff was upset about it. And, and then next thing, you know, WWE is knocking on my door with this big offer. WCW matches it. WWE offered me a big signing bonus. And then when they gave me, I could travel with my wife and, you know, and, and, and they were really thinking about putting the, the world strap on me. And, and when I first got there, you know, it was like, right. a really deal, and I thought it was really going to take off. And, but it was very difficult going from the Johnny B. Bad character to when they gave me this character, wild man, Mark Merrow, my first thought is what is a wild man? I mean, it I looks like that. they're making it like I'm from a, I'm from a jungle. Cause I, I remember in the, in the creative meeting, Vince said, can you do like a Tarzan yell? And I thought, <laughs> one thing I don't have is a strong voice. Like my voice is very um, scratchy, you know? So I can't yell loud. I don't have a loud yell. So I said, I don't think so. And when they showed me the drawings and everything, it was like, wow, I'm not sure what wild man is. So I never really connected with the character. Now, Johnny B. Bad was easy because it was so opposite me. It was like, yeah. it was like playing like this fun character that you're doing in a school play or something, you know? But wild man Mark Merrill was not, it was very, very difficult. And, and the fans didn't connect with it, you know? So yeah. it was very yeah. hard. You're doing all these great moves and matches and, and no one's really, but they're all they're doing is cheering for Sable. You know, walking yeah. the ring with Sable, they're like, "Whoa, look at her!" You know, yeah. so that's when I do this angle. After I, and then shortly after I got there, I blew out my knee where I needed a total reconstructive surgery on my knee, and now I'm out for eight months. And that time, they're using Sable to promote, you know, merchandise and things like that. And she's getting over bigger and bigger. The crowd's going crazy over. Her. So then they asked, you know, can she wrestle? So I would take her to the wrestling uh, school and and try and show her moves and stuff. And we did it just enough to get by, you know, she wasn't yeah. someone who could take really bumps. She was, you know, kind of a fragile person. So, um, but she did, the, she did a really good job for what we, she was called to do, you know, at least, yep. and then putting her with, with people like, like uh, Luna and Jacqueline and Tori, who are unbelievable wrestlers, made her look like she's been in the business for <laughs> years. You know, it, was, it was incredible. So obviously, um, you definitely prefer being Marvelous Mark Merrow over uh, Wild Man. Is that correct uh, in the end? Well, well, Marvelous Mark Merrow was just such a terrible person. I mean, the way I treated him. <laughs> He's the LA. best. He was yeah. the best. <laughs> so that was fun, you know, because now you got the crowd just hating you no matter what. It's, it's okay. Like, you don't want the crowd to hate you when you're Wild Man, Mark because you're, you're a baby face. You want, you want people to like you. So now it was like, screw you, hate me all you want now, you know? And, uh, so that that was that was fun to do, and you know, and, and it, it was hard. To, it was hard to because you see, the, the thought process behind it was I'm going to do anything I can to get my wife over. I mean, you're going to be married forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we'll make as much money as we can, you know, and just who cares if she's making it or I'm making it? And I was on a guaranteed salary, so I make the same amount every week, no matter what, you know. And uh, so it was just a matter of. Um, uh, you know, doing anything we could to get her over. And I remember when I allowed her to sable bomb me, which I taught her how to do, you know, yeah. I remember I was going to be going into a big run with Stone Cold, which would have been really cool, you know, but then when Stone Cold saw her power bomb me, he was like, there's no way if a girl can beat him up, what, 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 what you know, I, and I mm. take bumps for him. And I totally understood it. It was like, you know, totally get it. But it was, it, it didn't matter because all I cared about was 
they're now b- b- backing up the Brinks truck to our house. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? We're, it's, we're making a lot of money and doing really well. And um, unfortunately, the, the marriage didn't work out and we went both in our own ways and life goes on. Yeah, definitely, man. It's uh, Life does go on and it's uh, kind of one of those things. Do you f- sort of feel like being on the road uh, 24-7 um, sort of a test and uh, real, was a real test towards that uh, marriage and relationship? It was. I mean, there wasn't a lot of marriages that made it over the years in the, in the industry. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, you could probably count them on one hand, how many marriages really make it in that industry. It yeah. was very difficult being on the road all the time. And, um, you know, and, and I remember when I retired from wrestling thinking, oh my gosh, no more 250 cities a year, oh, no more yes. traveling. And then <laughs> I get into inspirational speaking and I'm doing 230, <laughs> 250 events a year I'm all over the country. I even went to Russia and spoke in Russia and Guatemala oh. and, and, and Canada and we're going all over the place. It's just crazy, you know? The only thing that slowed me down was this pandemic that we're, we're in right now. <laughs> See, it's like, this is a little sidebar. You say you speak Russian and Guatemalan. How many different languages uh, are you able to, wait, first of all, are you able to speak those languages fluently? I don't speak any of those languages. I'm, oh, I'm I speaking, just, you just spoke oh, English you, there. Yeah. But we had, oh, right. we had uh, interpreters, you know, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had really good interpreters too. I mean, they were just very proficient at what they did because the crowd got it. It was like the same reaction as the United States, you know? Yeah, man. Of course, if they get the message, because I thought you just said that you were able to speak Russian and Guatemalan. I was going to be like, oh, you're no. fluent in all those different languages. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, of course. Um, Marvelous Mark Murray was uh, so great at portraying a massive jerk. Um, how did you feel about that change uh, from Wild Man and Mark Murray? Um, of course, you feel like Wild Man wasn't you, but also Mark Murray. Do you feel like um, Marvelous Mark Murray was more the... Uh, more past side of you from when you were a fighter well, or from back in the day because of the similarity in, in boxing and things like that you know but yeah. i mean we, i we, we um sable and i would work hand in hand with vince russo on the writing of what we wanted to do and and him knowing that i was you know was doing anything to get her over or whatever it would take you know it was it was actually kind of fun you know everything we did uh, from you know the, the the bikini contest that she did against Jacqueline too. We, this yeah. was all part of a plan that we had, and it just kept getting you know better and better, and it really got her over. So when she eventually wrestled um, Luna or Jacqueline in one of the big matches, WrestleMania or whatever it would be, you know, it was just incredible. So it really seemed like Vince Russo had your back, and he really wanted to uh, nurture this story with you and Stable. Vince was a, you know what, everyone has opinions and stuff and I read stuff, but you know what, I can only go by how people treat me and, and what I've experienced with, with people. And I, I really like Vince Russo. I mean, he was really kind to me and, uh, you know, and obviously he, he thought huge of my, my wife at the time and wanted to really get her over. So part of that getting her over was, was you know, squ- squashing me down. But I was, okay. I was fine with it because like I said, we were married and, and I'm, and I'm getting a guaranteed contract. So it's not like I'm making less money if I'm not, even if I don't wrestle, I'm still making the same amount of money. Man, like, I don't care what anyone says. That was champagne television, all of that stuff in the angle. Like, it was just really good stuff. There's, there's, there's no doubt about it. Like, maybe you didn't get the angle with Austin because of the powerbomb. But I remember when I first saw her powerbomb you, I jumped out of my seat. I couldn't believe that she did that. <laughs> so I thought it was an amazing moment on television. Yeah, that was something we really had. It. We we worked out, but she was such a she was a really good athlete too. I mean, she she picked up things pretty quick. I mean, when she when she uh, said to me, I, I want to try that her her Karana off the top rope. I'm like, are you kidding oh, me? Yeah. So, I mean, and of course she's doing it to me, so I'm going to protect her the best I can. I, I'm the only one she's ever done to over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> remember, so we had to travel to do house shows together every night and so every night she's power bombing me she's doing the her crowd off the top rope and the, every town is going crazy over her beating me up so <laughs> i i always say online um like wrestling fans of today they're, they're no. so fucking critical of shit and i always see whenever they talk about sable they don't give her the credit that she deserves I honestly, when I was watching back then, I was like so invested, and I thought when she actually finally wrestled, I was like, "Wow! Like, look at what she's doing. She's 
before her, like there wasn't really any women's division. They brought back the women's title because of her. I just feel like she deserves a bit more credit for the fact that she only had a certain amount of tools, but with your help and with Jackie and Luna's help, she, she nailed it. Every time she went out there live on pay-per-view, she nailed it. Yeah. She, I, I definitely give her credit, man. She did a great job for what she had to work with. And, um, you know, it's something that we always look back and, and uh, hey, we're undefeated at WrestleMania. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we got our own streak. It's one. <laughs> hey, you can take that and leave it. Hey? Like, you might as well just take the one and just leave that. Leave it at that. Um, no point. Uh, yeah, Carl, back to you. All right. Um, so I, I wanted to just say this quickly. You've spoke about the brawl for all before. We don't need to go into it. We know what happened. But... Um, I want to know how you felt when you saw Bart Gunn drop JBL. Um, you know, at the time, I never got along with JBL. He, yeah. he was just not, a, we were not friends. Um, I didn't respect him. I was, I was glad when they, when they told me they were bringing me back into the brawl for when I get to fight him. I was really excited about it because I didn't, I didn't like him at that time. Yeah. And I got to tell you guys, I think he's, he's just an amazing friend now. I applaud him for what he does. He helps so many people. And, um, you know, we all go through stuff in life, man, you know? And, yeah, man. And I, I tell you, I'm, I'm just so honored to be his friend now and, and praise him when I see these amazing things that he's doing, building um, these places and i think it's in haiti with with water oh and, that's and right cool. he does that stuff yeah yeah he does some really cool stuff man and uh so for me you no know, my heart is for students and, and 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 people that are less fortunate um he's aces in my book i mean <laughs> now it's, it's like i i never liked him but man if i ever if we ever see each other we, we we talk on twitter every once in a while but if i ever see him in person it's just a big hug man just yeah but, <laughs> it uh, seems like you know, like looking back, I don't even I don't even like to think that I would I would think that way. But you know, uh, Butterbean, you know, he, he's a friend of mine. I mean, I I, I we did a um a, a pay per view together. Uh, the strongman uh, contest, or whatever. Man contest or whatever. Tough man contest, whatever it was. Yeah. You know, and fun, quick funny story about that was that uh, Butterbean's just a, he's a sweetheart of a guy. He's like a gentle giant, you know, <laughs> and so he's really kind. So. In the, in, the, in the match was, um, I think it was second or third round, I, I hit him over the head with a stool and uh, the stool <laughs> shatters in pieces, okay? So underneath the ring, there's two stools. There's a stool that you pull out for me to sit on in between rounds, and then there's a stool that's gimmicked where it just shatters in pieces. It's all taken apart and put together just enough to where I could hit him with it and it will shatter where he could take the bump without getting hurt. Well, what happened was, um, my trainer, Ray Rinaldi, was in my corner and he inadvertently handed me the wrong stool, the, the, the hard stool that was not gimmicked, okay? Oh. So I, I'm like, I got boxing gloves on, you know? So I can't really grip it really hard, you know? So I come down and I think it's going to shatter all over and it doesn't even move. If you watch the replay, then I had to hit him again and finally just the, the top of the stool comes off the whole round. <laughs> And so that night we went out to dinner with, with Bean and um, uh, he said, hey, Mark, you know, man, I, that stool, I got a big gash on my back of my head. He goes, that, that really hurt. I thought it was supposed to break in pieces. And I said, it, it was. <laughs> like, oh, shit. And he the wrong stool. He goes, oh. He goes, I that was, something was wrong there. <laughs> um, but he's a tough guy, man. He's a tough guy. Absolutely. He, he could punch. I mean, he would have knocked out. Cool. He, he, he could knock out anybody, you know? He's, he's just, if he hits you, he's going to knock you out. He could punch. Oh, man. I saw him hit Bart Gunn, and it looked like, well, a yeah. freight train. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it was kind of sad because Bart Gunn was finally going to get his due. You know, he's yeah. one of the toughest guys out there, you know? They and, set him up for failure. Come on, I mean, that's yeah, not fair. Yeah, see, if you, if you look at my, my, um, my brawl for all match, I, I never really even got hit. Um, the, 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 the scenario was, is, you know, I've had, I've had 14 surgeries. I've had 
uh, five shoulder surgeries and five elbow surgeries. So I never had the speed or power I did when I was a boxer. And plus, I remember I was a boxer at 175 pounds. Now I'm a bigger guy. I'm not boxing anymore. So I didn't yeah. have the same snap or punch that I had. But I, but I still had, no one's going to really hit me. My, my, my peripheral vision was really good where I'm not going to get really hit solid, you know? Yeah. yeah. So if you look at any of those matches, no one ever really even hit me, you know? It was just the takedowns, and you're wearing boxing gloves, right? So how are you supposed to defend yourself? Yeah, so it was really <laughs> frustrating. But, but as you know, the, the match with um, with JBL, it went all three rounds. They called it a draw, and then we had to go one more round, you know, and then they gave it to him. And, uh, and uh, you know, at the time I was upset, but you know what? I know I would have had a better chance with any of the other guys, especially Bart Gunn, because I, I, I don't think Bart Gunn would have ever connected solid with me. He wasn't fast enough to really hit me. But, you know, that's all water under the bridge, you know? It's yeah. like this thing we did. And, you know, the thing was is that um, being a kind of a tough guy and not afraid of anybody, it's like when Vince called me and said, we got this idea, you know, <laughs> brawl for all. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. like, I was going. But, you know, if you really look at it, you know, think about all the guys that wouldn't do it or didn't do it. And I don't want to name any names, but there's a lot of guys that knew it would ruin their career forever, you know? Absolutely. But, yeah. And, I, well, and I, I, saw, to... I saw that episode of uh, Dark Side of the Ring, and uh, a lot of the people on there were, like, bagging Vince Russo. It was such a terrible idea. Everyone got hurt. Vince didn't know everyone was going to get hurt. They're all incredible athletes. He probably thought yeah. that this would be fine. And that's the thing, what he said as well. And I just thought it was a little unfair for everyone after the fact to be like, oh, it was a terrible idea. But when the brawl for all is taking place and, you know, it's a sellout at the little TV screen backstage. Yeah, like, yeah. Everyone thought it was a good idea at the time. But then after the fact, they want to bag him out for it. And I just don't think that's fair. Yeah, well, you know, eventually it's got to go through Vince McMahon before it ever gets put on television. So, you know, if, if it was such a bad idea... Vince McMahon would have never allowed it to happen. And Absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, I want to take a quick sidebar and I just wanted to ask you, we ask everyone that was in the WWF, did you ever witness or were victim to an Owen Hart rib? Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. Uh -huh. He was a, he was a, a, a good person, you know, a family man, but I got to tell you the rib he did to me and Davey boy Smith. Okay. I'm wrestling Davey Boy Smith, and uh, we, we go into the locker room. We're the only ones in this particular locker room. And all of a sudden, we hear the door, the, the, the door shut and like, heard like a lock. Yep. And we're thinking, what the hell? So we, 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 could, we just continue talking, not thinking nothing of it. And now it was time to get ready to, to go out to the match. <laughs> and um, we go to the door, and the door is, we can't open the door. <laughs> Owen padlocked the door. Oh. <laughs> he padlocked the door. Now, and Davey is, if you know anything about Davey Boy Smith, he's like, that if and if and if and if and, you know, he's just going <laughs> on and on with his British accent so mad because now my music starts playing. Oh, my music, no. I gotta walk out to the ring, he's playing something like, Oh my gosh. And we're begging Owen, please, Owen, open the door, open the door, man. And, uh, uh, and Davey is furious, you know, now my music runs out. In other words, oh. they played the whole song. They start playing it again. And now I'm freaking out and <laughs> I'm like begging Owen to open the door. So, uh, someone else came over and opened the door for us. And, I run out to the ring and it's like you know, the, the announcers in the ring, like, where the hell have you been? You know, anyways, we have our match and everything. And after the thing, we, we, we find Owen, we're, we're pissed. We find Owen. He's like, <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> and then later on he admits it, but it, it was just typical Owen. He just could put you in a really bad place. Oh. But it was hilarious when you look back on that. I bet Bulldog was like, it's fucking Owen. It has to be yeah. fucking Owen. <laughs> oh, he knew it. He knew it. And that's exactly uh, the, the, what he would say. Oh, it's oh funny. God. Um, um, uh, 
Jack, I'm not really sure where we're at in, the, in our question here, but I guess... Uh, I do. Right, I do. You know, Sorry. You, I'll take it from take over? Cool, bro. Yeah. So um, at, at what point did you start feeling like you saw the writing on the wall uh, with wanting to leave the WWF? And how did you go about quitting the company? Oh, wow. You know, guys, uh, I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but I, I actually had three years left on a around, around $400,000 contract. Cool. At that time, you know, remember this is 20 years, 20, 20 years ago. You know, that's a lot of money back then, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess it's a lot of money now too, but, <laughs> but I, I had three years left on a guaranteed contract and I walked away. I remember after um, the last trip was a, was a, um, um, a UK uh, tour and we did a, we did a pay-per-view over in the UK and it was flying home. And I remember just remember just saying to my wife, um, let's just quit. We're done. And we, we, mm. we finished it. We, we, we stopped. We never went back. And then I went on to, um, I went to TNA for a little while. I went to XWF wrestling. They had Hulk Hogan started wrestling in, in this organization. We for that, that was short lived. And then we went to uh, uh, TNA and, um, and that was it. That was my last yeah. match, I think it was in 2006. Right. Um, I wanted to scale back quickly and just ask you about how did you go about quitting the company? Did you just call Vince and say, that's it, we're done or? Well, there was a, Gosh, guys, I, I even talking about this, it's like kind of uh, just bring, bring back bad memories. But uh -huh. my ex-wife, um, Sable, wanted to sue them because there was a, for sexual harassment. Uh, some of the guys cut a hole in the wall and looked into the, the girls' dressing room. Oh, uh, really? Fuck. Stuff, and, and, and it was really a, a bad scene, you know? So she, you know, she draw this lawsuit. And then I realized, man, last thing I want to be is around people that I'm going to be hanging out with that with my ex suing them, you know? Yeah. Okay. So it was just, a, just a, a family decision to say we're done. And we both went on and, and um, just went on with life, you know? And then, then uh, she, she decided later on a year or two later, can a year, two years, I can't remember. But it was I think like, it was 2003, maybe. Yeah. We, we left in 98 or 99. And then all of a sudden she said to me, what do you think of me going back to wrestling? And I said, what are, you, what are you crazy? Vince would never have you back. And she says, well, I called him. And I was like, shocked. Called him? Yeah. And then she went back. And it was, it was. I was, uh, I was a stay-at-home dad. And, uh, but you know what? That's, that was her. She missed that, 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 the limelight, her passion. And, you know, sometimes you don't realize what you have until it's gone. And yeah. apparently... It's something she really wanted back. And, uh, you know, and God bless her. I mean, she, you know, she met Brock. They fell in love. They got married. They got kids together. And, man, I wish them nothing but the best. That, that, and and that's, that's how you get on with life. You don't live with yeah. bitterness, resentment, or unforgiveness. It's like locking yourself in an emotional prison. And the only one that can set you free is yourself. And it's, by, yeah. it's with forgiveness. And just moving on, and, and and I've been blessed in my life. I never would have, never would have become an inspirational speaker. I never would have had this this incredible ministry champion of choices. I never would have been able to do the things I've done if if I would have remained in in that marriage. So it's you know I, I say that if I ever saw her again, the only thing I could ever say to her is thank you. you know, I have yeah. no, no animosity. I I, I interviewed a uh, great daughter. <laughs> we got a great daughter. You know, yeah, that's. Her eyes, uh, that's cool man i interviewed Lodi from wcw and his uh it's kind of the same thing it's like uh he can't help people without having going through hard times to be able to teach them so i think that rings true with what you're saying here um no i wanted to um quickly ask you about negotiations and what they were like with wcw in 2000 and is it true that you didn't sign because you had some nagging injuries um, in 2000, I think that's, they brought me back and they were doing something with Tank Abbott. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. 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 They flew me in for a one, one night thing. And you know what? It, it, it just, I've had so many surgeries, you know, I mean, it, it's incredible that, um, you know, through, you know, wrestling, <laughs> people say wrestling is fake. I said, well, maybe so, but gravity is real. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. You know? And uh, so I, it wasn't as important to me to get back in there and take all those bumps again and stuff. And, and now, uh, guys, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, in, I'm 60 years old now. I'm probably in 
one of the best shapes I've ever been in. I mean, wow. I, I have a personal trainer. I, I work out. I eat really good. I'm really healthy. But even now, it's like I wouldn't want to go in and take bumps. And yeah. you know, it's like yeah. why mess up your your body? Like it's too easy to get hurt when you get older. And a lot of these guys that try to come back end up getting hurt or or messing themselves up. And it's just not it's just not worth it, man. Yeah, fair enough. Um, no, I not. did want to mention quickly about your little time in XWF. I watched a match with you and Norman Smiley earlier. Um, <laughs> uh, you look to be guy. you're back and you were real lean. I mean, this is like 2001, 2002. You've been out of the ring for a couple of years, but um, how did you feel it was getting back into the ring at that point? Cause like, I, I was like, wow, you look so uh, slim and, and lean and, you really got yourself in some great well, shape. You know what's weird about that is they, they wanted me to do the Johnny B. Bad character, but now I got short hair, no mustache. <laughs> I don't like Johnny B. Bad. So it was, it was a little strange, but yeah, I, was in, I, I got myself in really good shape. I felt good in the ring. I felt agile and, and uh, comfortable. Uh, you know, whenever you, I've always been the type of person that whenever I do something, I really want to do it well, you know? So yeah. if, if I ever did get back in the ring, I'd really want to be in great shape where people go, man, he looks good. You know, he still can do this or that, or, you know, and I, in my mind, I can still do a shooting star press off the top rope, you know, in my mind, <laughs> now, whether yeah. my body follows me or not, that's yet to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jack, well, we got a few more questions left, Jack, if you want to take it away. Yeah. Um, so before we wrap up the wrestling side of things, just got a couple more questions. Then uh, we're going to go into the uh, motivational speaking. So I just wanted to, uh, this one was uh, just based on what you said before about the uh, Sable turning around in 2003 saying she wanted to go back to wrestling. 2004, you reprised your uh, Johnny B. Bad gimmick in TNA. Uh, was this one something you decided to do to end your wrestling career on a higher note when you exited from the WWF? I was obviously unhappy uh, with the business. No, I don't know if it's really ended on a happy note. Um, the Johnny B. Bad, like I said earlier, that was it was my favorite character. So you know, what what better way to go out than than being the old Johnny B. Bad character? Of course, hey. But I was never like thinking that um, Marvel, Mark, or Wildman were so bad. You know, I I, I wouldn't have changed a thing. You know, that's that's yeah. the thing when you look back in your life, like all the paths I took, good or bad, ended up to right where I am right now. Exactly. And it could, it couldn't be a better place. So. With all that being said, do you have any regrets from your time in wrestling whatsoever? You know, I don't live with regrets, you know, because, but if I had to say anything, it would be that I would have treated people better. You yeah. know, I would have been a better person. And, and maybe, you know, my mom used to pray for me all the time because I was getting a lot of trouble and stuff. And she always prayed that she knew the man I would eventually be. And I believe that her prayers finally came true. I mean, I really try to treat people, you know, they say treat people the way you want to be treated. I actually try to treat people better than I, I want to be treated. You know, I really want anybody I meet, especially now in my life, you know, we're all going to leave a legacy. You know, my legacy is not going to be, you know, what I accomplished in wrestling or how nice my car or house was or something like that yeah. or how much money I had. It's going to be the difference I made in someone else's life. And you can't make a difference in someone else's life by being rude or narcissistic or or mean or cruel or whatever you know and i want people to that that meet me or know me to say man he's a really good guy you know he really cared about me and and i do care and that's what's different i mean the greatest commandments that we have are love god and love people and i, I do both that's right yeah I and mean, that that brings us to pretty much what uh, fast forward to now um with the motivational inspirational speaking i uh, have what what brought you into that and how did you get into that it was, you know, it was such a fluke kind of um, was in after wrestling ended, I, I ended up becoming a personal trainer at, at a gym, you know, yep. and, and, and I, re, I remember that. And there's nothing, guys, please don't take this as anything bad nothing wrong with a personal trainer, but people perceive it like what happened to you, you know, like people yeah. would come in the gym and go, oh my gosh, Mark Merrill's here. What are you doing here? I said, well, yeah. I work here. And they go, what do you do? I go, I'm a personal trainer. Yeah. Really? Like, it was like, almost like you fell from grace, you know? Now, obviously, I bad financial decisions, divorce, everything that happens in your life, you, you end up, you know, in a certain place. So, of course, I'm not making a lot of money. But what happened was my clients that I was training, they were getting the best results. In other words, the before and afters were, like, incredible, you know? Similar to what DDP does, you know? It's, it's like I really took time and, 
motivated people, inspired them. And they, they, the, the amazing thing is they, they seen how much I believed in them, but the beautiful thing was to watch them believe in themselves. So yeah. anyways, to make a long story short, my, trainer, my, my client kept growing and growing and I couldn't take on any more people. So I eventually bought my own gym and I hired trainers and they trained my type of training and we had this amazing gym. Well, I bought the gym in, in 2007 and um, all of a sudden I got this phone call from uh, Melbourne High School. They wanted me to speak to their football team, you know, about yeah. drugs, don't do drugs, you know, and stuff and steroids and stuff or big in the high school and stuff. So I went and spoke to the kids and, you know, never really thinking much about it, but the kids started writing me and said, man, that really inspired me. You changed my life. And I was like, wow, that was so cool to know that something I said or from my past experiences helped somebody else. Well, that school happened to contact another school. We had this guy here that really inspired our kids. You might want to use him to talk to the whole school. Awesome. And it snowball. One school called another. And next thing I know, I'm going all over the, all the state of Florida. And I'm going all over the country and all over the world. And it just... This is this now starts my 14th year speaking at schools, and we're doing we're starting off virtually because of the pandemic we're all in right now. But until schools will allow uh, full assemblies, I'll be just doing virtual stuff until until that happens. So how does all the virtual stuff work? Uh, do they all sit in sort of an assembly hall? Uh, you're there on the webcam with them, and you're speaking to the entire school. Uh, I don't know what the situation is in the in, yeah, well, uh, United you know, States. That's a great question. It's just like what we're doing right now with Zoom. A lot of them are using yeah. Zoom and you have like hundreds of kids on these, on these Zoom calls because some of them are, are home. They're being, yeah. uh, they're being virtual schooled. Or, and um, so we've been doing it that way. We just did one last week. I was like 400, 400 students. And, you know, the thing is, like I'm talking to you guys, um, I'm looking into a, uh, my, my camera. I could, see, I could see both you guys, but when you have that many kids, you, yeah. they, they don't have you seen all these kids. So you're basically just looking at your, your laptop computer, you know? Yeah. And you don't, you know, when you're live, you see the emotion, you see the tears, the laughter, you see kids hugging, you see high five and you see all these cool things, you know, but when you're just looking at your laptop, you're wondering, are they even listening? Are they even getting yeah. it? You know, and you're doing this powerful emotional presentation, you know? So the other day, um, you know, I, I did this big presentation and we got the feedback from the school. The, the principal said that the students said the best part of this, this uh, Youth Leadership Institute was your presentation. They gave you five out of five stars. So wow. to know that I, was, I made a difference even virtually was, was a great thing because uh, we want to do more of these, obviously, and especially with what kids are going through right now, guys. I mean, there are so many kids that are so depressed, the isolation, the loneliness, the, the suicidal thoughts these kids are having because of, of, of what's happening in their life right now, the uncertainty, you know, I just want to bring them hope. I want them to know that this too shall pass. You know, we've all been in some tough situations in our life and the, 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 the human mind often goes to the worst case scenario. We always think, Oh my God, you're not going to believe what's going to happen. You know, instead yeah. of, why can't we think a better case scenario, like we're going to get through this, there's going to be a, a vaccine, school's going to be back in session, uh, whatever a positive thing may be, you know, and that's why I want to bring hope. I want, I want them to know that it's going to be okay, you know. I know, you know, some people have it a lot worse than us, you know, but guys, I, I look at you two guys, you look really healthy, and I think about that there's someone on a ventilator right now who may not wake up tomorrow. We yeah. are so blessed. We have a roof over our head. We have food in our refrigerators. We have uh, you know, running water, we have so much to be thankful for. But often we take advantage, we take for granted the very things in life we should appreciate, and especially the love of our family. Yeah, absolutely. that's right, man. That's, uh, that's it, man. That, that's what it's all about. I think it's, um, I think it's important at this stage, Jack, to talk about anti-bullying. Um, and Jack, would you be able to tell Mark about your experience being bullied? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so for a lot of uh, people that do uh, know this, watch this, or listen to this podcast, know me very personally. Um, so being a, this is actually, it's, it's a pretty ironic situation uh, for the reason I was bullied and then talking to a professional wrestler. So being uh, such a uh, big, big professional wrestling fan growing up, um, everyone that knew me as a child knew I loved professional wrestling. And um, obviously, you know, how kids be in high school, uh, early high school, so let's say uh, year eight and nine in the United States, is that uh, freshman, junior? 
I'm not too sure um, how it all works, middle school. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, what, 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 what age were you? I was 13 years old. Was, yeah, that's, that's like a eight, eight, eighth, eighth or ninth grade here. Yeah, so middle it was just, um, uh, it was a very, it was probably about a three year period from about 2011 to 2013. So it's yeah, about three, two, three years. And I was, at this, uh, I was at one school and it was uh, constantly all the time. Uh, it would be on social media, uh, whether it would be um, posting on um, a wall or it could even be something as like yelling at me in the canteen, whether it could be like wrestlers' names, wrestlers' finishing moves, which is, just sounds so stupid when you look back on it because someone would be yelling, you know, RKO out or 619 or whatever. Because, you know, again, 22 is so when we were all growing up. Uh, ruthless aggression era was kind of what we all... Uh, or watching as kids, but um, the reason why this campaign hit so close to me was uh, not only was I going through a lot of the bullying stuff myself due to my interest in, say, pro wrestling, also me as a person, as I, uh, I was very skinny. Um, there was someone that was uh, at our school as well who took her own life uh, in 2012, um, and she was, God, 13, 13 or 14 years old. And uh, for someone to be sort of exposed to that, uh, to that sort of thing and um you know be taking their own life at such a young age um because you know 13 14 you know we shouldn't even really be thinking about you know suicide and or and even sort of any mental health uh sort of um issues that people might be facing and um it was very cutthroat um in that in that environment so that's, that's why i felt like your your story hits your and what you're trying to tell to these kids at school but hits very close to home because i was going through it very very aggressively for years and um plenty of fights you know plenty plenty of fights and just yelling out in class people throwing stuff at you whether it would be pens or you know just 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 being an inconvenient and to go through that and then to sort of see what you were uh the videos that you're posting online as i was trying to say earlier tonight um i felt like it was uh, very fit not only fitting uh, it was important that we um, have this sort of, uh, sort of conversation on, on our podcast, um, being sort of a victim of uh, that sort of situation myself. So I do commend you very, very much for um, sort of trying to spread that message to those kids in the school, because I know how it feels firsthand. And, um, you know, it's, it would suck for a lot of those other kids who are still going through those things it, today. It does suck, dude. It, it completely sucks, you know. Mm. When I was first a wrestling fan, I was in primary school. This is 1998, 1999. Wrestling was cool, so you didn't get picked on for it. But when I was in high school, uh, it wasn't as cool anymore. So because you like wrestling and you like watching men in their <laughs> trunks wrestle each other, apparently you're gay. So you get picked on and you get told that you're gay and, and all this stuff. And it happened to me a lot too. Like, I don't think I ever told any of you guys, that, any of you guys this, Jack, but uh, like, you know. They picked on me because of that stuff, just because I was a wrestling fan. Among other things, I mean, I was very skinny too. I mean, I'm not skinny anymore, but back then I was picked on a lot because of it. And uh, and when 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 someone's being bullied, they end up bullying someone else. Exactly. Because right, they, yeah. they 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 got to uh, I guess they got to get it out of their system. The way that they're being bullied, they got to like make themselves feel bigger, so they pick on someone who's even weaker than them. So that's why, as you're saying this, Jack, Mark, what you're doing is incredible and bullying is so horrible and it, it, it shapes people's personalities because this is during a time in their life where their brain is still growing and they're still becoming a, an adult. They're on their way to becoming an adult. And, and when you have these uh, horrible situations take place, it really uh, it messes with your brain when you're, when you're trying to mature. Definitely. Well, guys, I want to just say I commend both of you guys for um, understanding and, and having empathy and, and sympathy for other people that are going through it or have gone through it. Your stories mean a lot. And, and it's funny how you meet someone that, that you share your story and they, they feel like they're not alone. They feel like you understand what they're going through. The, the, the situation we deal with with a lot of kids that are bullied, see, you never know what someone else is going through in their life. You don't know if their parents just got divorced, if they lost a, a loved one, if their pet died or something happened in their life that's traumatic. And all of a sudden you tell someone how ugly or stupid or worthless they are and they just don't care. They just they feel like they don't, they don't matter anymore. And, and that's where we see a lot of these kids that end their life. And you're right, like 13 years old, you shouldn't be thinking about killing yourself. You yeah. have your own life out of you. And one of the things I, I, I share with students is that 
you know, there was a time in my life, my depression just overtook me when, you know, divorce and loss of loved ones and everything I was going through at that time, financially broken. Oh, just knowing I once had it all and now I lost it all. And I just didn't want to be here anymore. Every day when I wake up, I look up and I am so thankful I didn't hurt myself or take my life. I never, I never would have known all the beautiful things that were to come. That's just right. like the people that I, I share this with, you know, that they don't, you have no idea the great things that are going to come in your life. The best chapters of your life are about to be written, but you yeah. have to realize that you are the author of your story. And every day you can write a new page and those new pages, they become your new chapters. Chapters like overcoming adversity, never giving up, you know, making the, the, your dreams become your reality in life. And I look back and I think about all the things that have happened now in my life. I never would have known or been blessed with the friends I've met, watching family members graduate or, or be marriages or whatever it would be, you know, that I, I got to see and experience. And I really, I still believe that my, my best chapters are still ahead of me. See, you, you want to live with hope. You know, you want to live with the rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. Not thinking that the best days have passed. Who wants to live like that? Nice. It's like say that, what, what, I want to always believe that something better is going to happen in my life, you know? And that's where a positive attitude comes in. That's why our minds are so powerful. I mean, you, 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 you know, like I said earlier, that when we... When, when, when we're depressed or worried about something, we often go to the worst places. And when you look back on your life, you go, oh, it wasn't even that bad. Because we always just think the worst thing's going to happen. And often it doesn't, or the words are never as bad as we envision them to be. Yeah. So I, I thank you guys for, for, for talking about that. Uh, that's very true. Because I, I look back on that, uh, that sort of period of my life. And um, so the experiences I've been through since um, the last three years of my life haven't been so great, um, you know, uh, and here we go. Full disclosure to everyone that listens to this podcast. I lost my mother two years ago um, and all that sort of things like that. So there's been a lot of uh, situations uh, over the last couple of years that have made me sort of uh, look back on the time where I was just getting bullied in school. And that was the worst of my issues. And back then I treated it like it was the end of the world. Like, oh, my life is going to be ruined because I'm getting bullied in school and all these things. And I think it's very important just to stick it out. I mean, look, it is what it is. I mean, yeah, and it, it sucks that this stuff is happening. But, and the best thing you can do is, is try to teach these kids that it's not right and that there is another way to just, to, to, to just don't be that sort of person is essentially what I'm trying to say. Um, and, w- and once you get out of high school, Jack, you never see any of those people exactly again. Right. Yeah, you never actually, see them again. They, they, you know what, it, no, yeah. they, they're out of your system. You know, it's very funny. You know, that we're having... It's realizing that you're not defined by their opinion. You know, and yeah. I tell these kids, they don't base your limitations on what other people think or say. You know, we, we tend to care so much about things that matter so little. How yeah, many man. likes did I get on my social media page today? <laughs> what are people saying about me? You know? Yeah. They don't even know you, you know? They don't yeah. know the amazing person you are. They only know from what someone might have said about you or what they read or, or something like that. You know, I mean, it, it's it's sad because, you know, you, I get a lot, you know, as, as much as the positive stuff I get every day, there's always something, something that says something that's mean or, or, or rude or whatever, you know? And guys, now in my life, I, 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 I actually pray for that person. I said, maybe they're going through a really hard time. Maybe something happened in their yeah. life that they feel like, like you mentioned, you know, bully people, bully someone else, you know? And, and, and I don't take offense to it, you know? And often many people have said or have wrote something mean or bad about me, have since got, got to know me and said, man, hey, I, I said something about you once. I, I just want to say I'm really sorry or something. That's like, yeah. Are you me? I don't even think about it. I don't, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, of course, I'm not, never going to hold a grudge against somebody. But, uh, you know, well, guys, it's, it's getting through it, but it's, um, it's paying it forward. It's helping someone else get through it because, you know, it's, it's I always tell people, you know, do for, do for them what you wish was done for you or, or maybe was done for you, you know, and that, that always helps. But guys, you guys are, you're, you're over in Australia. And it's one of the places I've always, um, right. I've always dreamed about coming to. You need to. The, 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 the I, I sure hope, we were so close to doing a tour with you guys and it fell through at the last moment. And I hope they, they reconsider doing it again once we get through this pandemic and kids are back to a normal uh, place in life. 
um, because I would love to come there. It'd be great to meet you guys too, man. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It would be awesome to get you like in touch with uh, some of the schools around here as well. Um, and hey, to... I'm, I, I used to do uh, work with the education department here in, in our state. So, um... well, if you have any connections, please uh, tell them about us. Have them go to our website. Um, you know, it's been, you know, hopefully that, like I said, we, we get to get through this, this pandemic and, and we'll get back out on the road again. But up in, now we're just doing stuff virtually. And we built a really cool studio here in Florida that we're doing the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, shows out of now, which are pretty cool. Cool, Mark. Um, and before we finish up tonight, I've got a little segment called Five Second Frenzy where I just want to learn a little bit about other things that you like in life. Uh, you got okay. five seconds to answer each question. It's just like your favorite whatever. Um, okay. So number one, Five Second Frenzy, your favorite musical artist. Wow. Oh, five seconds. Um, oh. Aerosmith. There you go. <laughs> Are your favorite TV show? Uh, oh God, I don't watch TV. We're not even recording. I mean, oh, my favorite so TV much. show. Um, oh, gosh. Maybe when you were a kid. It's a hard one, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. Yes. I, when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> it's a really good show, though. It is. Uh, your favorite film? Favorite film? Um, wow. Gosh, these are tough questions because there's you know you see so much now that it's hard with yeah. five seconds to really think of something. Oh, uh, it's yeah. okay. You don't, you don't need to worry about the five seconds. Yeah. You just like to say that to pressure people. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the uh, the Mel the Mel Gibson movie um, Resurrection of Christ I think it was called. Or the, the, oh right, yeah. It uh, was powerful, man. I still it haven't like seen that. I should watch that. Yeah, it was a really powerful movie that just makes you realize realize what Christ went through for us. And, and really Absolutely. Um, you're thirsty. What's your favorite beverage when you're thirsty? Water. I drink water all day long. Straight up, just straight up <laughs> ice cold water. Here we go. Very water. nice. Uh, uh, what's your favorite food, Mark? Favorite food, chicken. Nice. Respect. Okay, your favorite female body part. Uh, <laughs> had a lot of interesting my answers. favorite female body part. <laughs> I eyes eyes are the nice. most yeah thing. we've had eyes before so i'm not surprised i, I back that eye like that's i a, love man. eyes man yeah, yeah. My, my girlfriend's you know, eyes are amazing like you can see kindness in eyes you know yes. and, and empathy and compassion and you know when you talk to someone it's like how their eyes react whether it's they water up or they cry or or just laughter you know whatever yeah it's, I, I get you that was the first thing that i noticed about my girlfriend uh she has these cheeky eyes and that just sold me straight away uh, oh, so, awesome. <laughs> uh and look I, I i'm sure you don't have an answer for this one but um your favorite curse word my favorite curse word um i guess i'm gonna go with uh i'll take i'll steal one from ron simmons <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, right. Mark. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much, mate. Uh, no, you awesome. guys are great, man. Thanks for having me on your show. And, and, and God bless Australia, man. I know you guys are experiencing your own difficulties. And just pray everything works out. Take care, guys. Me too. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. And um, Jack, uh, before we go, I just want to say to Mark, you should be so proud of everything you accomplished in wrestling, my friend. And, and not just that, the entertainment that you gave to guys like me and Jack, but what you're doing now, you, this world is a better place because Mark Miro exists. And I just um, want you to know that we uh, appreciate you. Guys. And if you guys see above my, my head, my head, this side here, this side here, that's yeah. my little boy, Rocco. <laughs> that's my roommate right there. <laughs> Rocco the Wonder Dog. I love it. Oh, he's cute. All right, guys. Take care, man. God awesome. bless. Thanks a lot, right. Mark. Sign us off, Jack. And uh, yeah, so that's um, 55 Live Podcast with Marvelous Mark Merrow. And uh, we'll see you next time.